Praise the Lord. Now, let me start by saying that the natural human being, man, woman, the human species, is a complex combination of intricate components. So when you look at a man, yourself, and you look at yourself in, in the mirror or your neighbor, that person is a complex link of different components, physically, physiologically. The medical doctors will agree that man is very, you know, the body of man, the way it works, it's, it's something of an, an enigmatic thing. It's mysterious. And, you know, you, you have a cut on your hand, immediately your body kicks in trying to heal itself. All, all those things, we take it for granted, you know. We just, because you just wake up in the morning and you just walk and you take it for granted. But you've not actually understood or sat down to realize that you are actually a complex being. The psalmist said it, he said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He sat down to ponder about the workings of man. All it takes for you to realize the complexity of man is for something to go wrong in the body. Realize that what you took for granted actually is not always supposed to be taken for granted. Huh? You sleep and you sleep in a wrong angle and then to stand up becomes a problem. And then you are wondering and then all of a sudden you realize that, okay, this is <laughs> the man, the man. Somebody say, I am fearfully made. Say, I am wonderfully made. And that's not the, the only part of man that puzzles um, the thinker or anyone that thinks. The inner workings of man is also a mystery, is a wonder. Do you know how much information you have processed this morning alone with your mind? Do you know that you sat down because your mind already told you that that seat could handle your weight? Did you know that? It's unconscious. You, you, you get what I'm saying? It's unconscious to you. You just know that it can sit you. If you got into another place and they give you a stool, you won't sit down because somewhere in your mind, you know, you've not weighed it. You don't even know what it is. But automatically, your mind walks and tells you, this thing cannot handle my weight. Man is complex. You have processed colors. The moment you came in here, you process color. You are processing sound. I'm speaking to you. You are interpreting what I'm saying to have meaning of it. Man, natural man is a wonder. Which is why when God made everything in Genesis chapter 26, he said, let us make man in our image. Man was the crown of God's creation. Some people say they are higher animals. God bless them. I'm not an animal. I'm a man. <laughs> huh? I'm not an animal, I'm a man. Some people say they descended from Australopithecus Africanus. They say they came from Homo, Homo erectus to Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, sapiens, and all those funny stuff. Praise the Lord. If you came from a monkey, no wonder you look like one. <laughs> I didn't come from a monkey, I came from God. I'm clear in my mind, I may not be able to explain how. I'm not a scientist, I don't debate. You can go on and do all those beautiful philosophers that write books and tell us there is no God. I can't explain, but I know I came from God. If you came from an animal, I'm not arguing with you. There's no argument about it. You're a monkey, you're a monkey. That's fine. Praise the Lord. But what am I saying? I'm saying that the natural human being is a phenomenon on its own. If you study yourself, you realize that you're actually a wonder. That is why at no point do you feel you are worthless. The Bible says a man's life shall not be consist of the abundance of the things he possesses. What you possess don't define your worth. You are worthy because you are a man. You are worthy because you are a woman. Your existence alone is the worth. As a natural man, now I'm not even talking about a Christian. You see, the inner workings of man is such that it is able to bring into existence things that did not exist. Why? Because Genesis 1.26 says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And God is a creator. So when he made man, he gave man the innate ability to create, to bring things into existence. So you have constantly realized, if you have been following life for the past 20 years or 30 years, you will constantly realize that what is fiction becomes reality. 
I lost some people there. Now, if you, how many people know the Knight Rider? Now, the, the, I've lost the, the millennials, if you, if, if you, I mean, I've lost them. How many people know the Knight Rider, the movie Knight Rider? <laughs> Don't raise your hand, Demi. <laughs> it was before your time. <laughs> Now, the Knight Rider was a movie then. There was this car. About 30-something years ago, they made the movie. When you talk to the car, it will talk back to you. Ha! Ah. Now, to Demi, she's still thinking, so what? Because that is now a norm. At that time, it was fiction. A man's mind was just playing around. What he played around with as a fiction years after has become a reality now. That tells you the capacity of man to create. At a point, do you know there was nothing flying in the air called an aeroplane? Did you know? Or you thought God created the aeroplane? <laughs> At a point, there was no car. People were moving around on horses or chariots that were pulled by horses. Not a billion years ago. At a point, there was no car. And then when they started making cars... <clears throat> Ford Model T. You, you look at those cars and you wonder, what, did anybody actually sit in this thing and drive it? And then they started improving on it. And then those of us that came from the blessed country called Nigeria, at a point there was one fantastic car called Pojo. <laughs> we call it Pijo. <laughs> hey! 504. <laughs> then they move. They added one to it. 505. Then they move from now on. 505 evolution. Ah! I know it was 404 first. Those car, they will say there is no, in those days they will say there is no car like Peugeot. It doesn't break down. You will use it and then it will start using you. He had three speed, three gears, then four. And then the first time we heard that a car had five speed, five. Ha! It is time to meet with the angels. <laughs> now we don't even know. They've got all seven and eight. It's of note. And it was manual. There was nothing. There was no such a thing as an automatic. You had to press the clutch and engage the gear. Now, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about man without God. Just man. Because he was man. But it is the right of a natural man to create. It's not God anything to do with God. It's the way God made him. Whether he knows God or he doesn't know God, he's of no consequence. God made him and made him an independent creator. Which is why the people that have created the things they are using, they don't say they know God. They are book facing, facing book. Did he come to, is he in church? <laughs> First timer? <huh? laughs> no. A man just sat down in somewhere in a college and decided, I want to bring the whole world together and created. You do know Facebook was not there 20 years ago. How many years ago? It wasn't there. In fact, there was once a time, some of you will find it difficult to believe now because you have lived in, that, in this era so long. There was once a time there was no internet. <laughs> now you're thinking, oh, was there? Oh, yeah, no, there was. There was once a time that if you wanted to call. <laughs> See, I've lost all the millennials. I'm punishing you today. <laughs> Some people have never seen those kind of phones before. You pull it like this, and then it will go. You go, it will go. You go, it go. And then they made these mobile phones. You have to carry it with two hands. <laughs> Natural, normal human beings. No God, they didn't know God. So the mind of man, the inner workings of man is so complex that if that man begins to tap into the resources of himself that God gave him, he is capable of doing unimaginable things, things that are fictitious, things that are not real, he is able to bring them into reality. 
that's the way it was created. And the good thing or the bad thing or the interesting thing is that it can be used for good. It can be used for bad or for evil. And guess what? God does not interfere. You didn't hear what I said. The people that made atomic bomb, God could have struck them dead. It doesn't interfere. If you want to kill yourself, go ahead. A wicked man, al-Baghdadi, who was just killed by America a few seconds ago, he sat down in a remote place, far away, inside one jungle somewhere, and decided to create a group called ISIS. He decided to create a caliphate. The human mind, now I'm talking about, I'm talking about the human mind. He didn't go to church. He sat down and created an organization that became so bad that <laughs> it became so bad from inside the jungle. We are hearing about it here in London. I'm going somewhere. I'm not praising ISIS. He's a madman. They've killed him. He's a foolish man. But I'm saying for good or for bad. And you know the interesting thing? Britons, British-born people, were tearing their passports, flying across the ocean to go and meet a man in the jungle because of an ideology that is sold. What are you selling? You come into church and think church is the playing field. No, you are wrong. Church is the training ground. Outside there is the playing field. You don't display here. We don't need you to display anything here. We are all Christians. What do you have? We have God. I have God. Finish. What you display is out there. This man did not meet on Sunday. He, did, he doesn't have church on Sunday. How was he able to grow from a wilderness into a most potent evil force? Ask yourself the question. He didn't have education. You have degrees, more than thermometer. <laughs> and all you want to do is be the king over the ten people in your department. And you flex it. When you come, that is when you show your muscle. The moment you come to the door of the church now, you become another person. On Friday, your 23-year-old boss gave you an assignment. He said, it's okay, I will deliver it today. 23-year-old, you are 45. You didn't see age then. The moment you walk through the church like this, then your shoulder will be touching your head. <laughs> the usher will say, Can you sit down? are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? <laughs> we just told you to sit down. <laughs> they gave you instruction in the workplace on Friday. You took it. Humbly, you smile. You didn't raise your voice. Because you know in that place, if you raise your voice. <laughs> here, we come in and we begin to display. Demonstrate. I, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> anyway, natural human mind, human mind or human being aside. We're not talking about you. You. You are not just a normal, natural human being. You are now born again. Which means you now have two origins. You have the natural capabilities, which I've just described. You can do, you can explode. Now, a dimension has now been added to you. That them lot don't have. A dimension has been added to you as a believer that the ones that are not Christians do not have. The Bible tells us in the book of Galatians chapter 5, it says the fruit of the spirit is Love, joy, peace, patience, long suffering. He lists an entire catalog. And he says that is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, when you read your Bible, uh, oftentimes if you are reading the old King James, he writes the Spirit in capital letter S. Wrong translation. It's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it's the fruit of the recreated human spirit. Oh, yes, born by the influence of the Holy Ghost. But it is the fruit, you see, capital letter S. Wrong. It's small letter S. It's your spirit. It's the fruit that your spirit bears. How do I know? The preceding verses, he talks about the works of the flesh. Whose flesh? Your flesh. When he's talking about the fruit of the spirit, whose spirit? Your spirit. So he's talking about you. You bear these things. 
Now, this fruit of the spirit, they are supernatural things. They are not normal. They are not natural. They are what makes you different in your behavior. Stop saying, I am a melancholy, I am sanguine, I am penguin, I am a, uh, all these funny things. You give yourself title and names and you label yourself. Me, I say it the way I am or the way I see it. That's because I'm a sanguine. Shut up, you're a Christian. The Christian has the same behavior. You may now be more outspoken. You may, not, you may be reserved. You may have all of those things, but the fruit of the Spirit is not predicated upon your sanguine or melancholy. Stop making excuses for being carnal. If you are carnal, you are carnal. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit, anybody that is born again has this capacity to supernaturally love. He has the ability to forgive beyond reason. Which means everybody is saying it doesn't make sense that you can forgive this person, yet you are forgiving the person. Why? You have the capacity they don't. Why? They don't have what you have. <clears throat> Being a Christian and what marks you out is not your capacity to speak in tongues for six hours. Jesus said, love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Which means what marks you out a difference from them is not just your capacity to create, it's your capacity to love beyond reason. You are patient. Somebody gets under your skin and instead of losing it, you just smile. And they're wondering, why are you smiling? Did you not just hear what he said? I said, I heard. And they still can't understand. You heard what he said. Yes, I heard. And you are smiling. Yes, I am. You, you can't. The Christian is the one that should confuse the world by their responses to things. Yet, we don't know. Because we think being a Christian is coming to church... And having a long list of items that we want God to do. And we tick it every morning. Tick this one. Tick that one. Tick that one. Kill my enemy. Kill my enemy. Promote me. Give me money. Give me house. That, that's not what it is to be a Christian. It means to be Christ-like. On the cross. They are torn off the body of Jesus. I described it the other day. I won't describe it again. They are ripped off his skin. He had no skin on his back. When you looked at Jesus when he was going to the cross, he had no more skin. All you could see was a messed up, mashed up body that was red. They had taken off the, I don't, don't let me say it now. Is he epidemics or demis now? Whatever. They've removed the first layer of the skin. <laughs> this is how you know the people that went to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> they had torn off all the first layer of his skin. All that we're seeing were the things behind blood. And right there, when he was hanging on the cross, the man was still ministering to the very same people that did that to him. That cannot be normal. And that is who you are. You need to start understanding that number one, what makes you out, what marks you different from the world, is one, the fruit of the Spirit. You have the fruit of the spirit. You are able to do it. They can't. And until you begin to walk in it, you are walking like them. If you respond the way they respond, why are you different? You are fighting someone in the car lot. Ha. You. Exchanging, shouting, and becoming like a mad person. You. No. No. You smile. You smile. Your body wants to. I have literally wanted to slap people in church, not on the road. In church, I, I should slap this guy. If I should slap this guy and show him I'm, I'm from the streets. I've got street cred. But while I'm saying that, I'm smiling on the outside. The man does not know. I'm saying, you're blessed, brother. <laughs> By faith. The fruit of the spirit is born by faith. Every, your life is a life of faith. It's not fake. I'm controlling my body. So you're blessed, brother. What a nice shoes you've got. I feel, in my mind, I'm saying I will remove that shoe. I used to beat you to death. <laughs> the fruit of the spirit. It's number one thing that marks you out. The difference. These are the things that makes the Christian unique. One, fruit of the spirit. Two, that makes you unique. Apart from the first thing that I talked about, the natural man, is your supernatural ability to be led by God. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> the Christian has the capacity to be led by God. Hmm. 
I can teach on that, but that's not where I'm going today. Proverbs 20 verse 27 says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Your spirit is the candle. He begins to lead you supernaturally, which means everything seems like it is going right, but somewhere in your inside, you are feeling like going left. It's got nothing to do with what you've learned. It's got nothing to do with what your experiences has taught you. But somewhere on your inside, the spirit of God that is on your inside is leading you. Problem is that we have not developed or cultivated the art of being led. And the only time we want to hear God speak to us is when we want to get married. So when it is time to make a choice... Big choice. That's the first time you now remember how I'm praying. I'm waiting on God for it. <laughs> I laugh. Some people have come to me and I've said, oh, why are you not dating that guy? I'm still praying to God about it. And I'm thinking, but all the decisions of your life, you didn't pray to God about it. This is the only one you want to hear God's voice. How will you know when God speaks? That's the question. How you know? Basic little things. We, are, we need to culture ourselves to follow the leading. How does God lead to you? When we come, when we come on the stage and we, and we say things like God spoke to me, God told me, God, you need to understand what we're saying. At times God speaks in audible voices. Most times he does not speak, he doesn't speak in words. He speaks in leanings. He speaks in witnesses. He speaks in impressions. What do I mean? Your spirit is born again so you can trust the voice of your conscience. The same conscience that tells you when you have done something wrong. How do you know? Did God speak to you? You did something and automatically everything erupts on your inside. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I shouldn't have done that. Mm -mm. You are arguing with yourself. That is the voice. The same way is how God leads you. So when you want to take a step, you see a green light. You can't explain it. It's just like there's a light going on in your spirit. At times when you want to take the step, you hear a red light. Mm -mm. At times you see an amber light. Hold on. These are the things you need to cultivate yourself to know how to do. Otherwise, you will constantly be hitting and missing. It's an advantage that only the believers have. For only the believers can be led by the Spirit of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Stop making natural decisions on everything you do in your life. Know how to hear God for yourself. Stop depending on the person holding the microphone. The ministry of the prophet in the New Testament is different from that of the old. In the old, only the prophet hears from God. In the new, everybody is a prophet. I remember one of my kids called me and she said, oh, Pastor T, um, what is God saying? I said, are you deaf? <laughs> so what do you mean? I said, if he's saying it, you should be hearing it too. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not a private line. If he's saying it about your life and you want him to tell me, is it not very interesting? Somebody will come to you and you say, well, pro prophet, professor, what is God saying to you about me? And I'm thinking, God is talking to me about you. Why should he be talking to, is he a gossip? Why is he talking to me about you? Can he, have I, has he finished talking to me about me? <laughs> Learn to grow. Take responsibility and hear God for yourself. Make your mistake. It is your right to make a mistake. Then right. anybody that you had, you thought you had God and it wasn't God. So what? So what? You missed it, you learn. You missed it, you learn. God wants you to walk on your two feet. Can you imagine 13 years? Now, I just, gave, I just gave a shout out to King. Can you imagine, Ma? King, 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 waking up and saying, Mommy, come and carry me and give me a bath. Will you not slap the living daylight out of him? <laughs> a boy that big. You walk on your two feet. Stop becoming a child. Perpetually grow. You know, everybody comes to church for different things. The reason you should come to church is to be trained, to be schooled, to be equipped. I follow the leading of the Holy Ghost, so I'm able to beat the world. I beat them. Every single thing that, that they've said I can't do, I've done. Uh, London is a level. I will level you now. <laughs> Who will you level? Me. You can't level me. <laughs> because when I came here, I came here with the level. With the level of God. Anywhere you go, you must go with that assurance. Ah, Jesus. I know who I am. 
Tell your neighbor, I know who I am. Say like you mean, I know who I am. So the second thing is that you're led by the Spirit supernaturally. I, don't, I can teach that, but that's not my, where I'm going. The third thing, which is where I'm going to park the car, is that we are sealed by God. That's the third thing that makes you unique and different from every other person. Somebody say, I'm sealed. I'm sealed. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. 13 says, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. And after this, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed. But you were not sealed with gum. You were sealed with a person. And the person you were sealed with is the third person of the Godhead. So read your Bible and read it patiently. Don't run. Don't rush. He says you were sealed and the material that God used to seal you is the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, I'm sealed. And you were sealed. Verse 14 says, you were sealed by the Spirit of promise. Verse 14 says, which is the guarantee Which is the guarantee, Arabon in the Greek, means the assurance, the seal that you are sealed with, which is the Holy Ghost, is the assurance, is the guarantee of our inheritance. Now, let me explain, because this is where we're going. When God's... When you got born again, what happened is you changed locations. And then God sealed you in with the Holy Ghost. And that seal of the Holy Ghost is now the guarantee that everything that has been done in Christ, you will inherit while you are walking on earth until the final inheritance when you change your body. That is what he's talking about there. Don't be confused by scripture language. That's all he's talking about there. What does he mean to be sealed? What does he mean to be sealed? Because the Christian needs to understand these terminologies in scripture. So that he can build confidence in what he has become. Or in whom he is and in whom or in who or in whatever. English at times, gosh, I just feel like speaking in tongues, but you won't understand. <laughs> you are sealed. What does it mean to be sealed? Fragizo in the Greek, it means to stamp with a signet. It means to mark as a private property. Did you hear what I'm saying? To be sealed with the Holy Ghost means to mark a person, to mark them out, <laughs> to mark them out, to separate them from every other because of that seal. You know, when you read your Bible in the book of Genesis chapter 4 verse 15, the first person that was sealed or that was marked was Cain. Remember that story? When Cain killed Abel and God did all that, told him what was going to happen, he started complaining to God. He said, everybody will be looking to kill me everywhere I go, blah, 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 blah. And then God said, no man. Listen to me. God said, no man should touch Cain. Who the, if he ever touches him, will be in trouble. And to help man from not touching Cain, the Bible says God put a mark in the Hebrew. It's called Uf, which means a seal. He put a mark on Cain. So everywhere Cain went, there was something around him that told everyone, don't kill him. I'm, I'm building my case. <laughs> Remember the story that pastor told us last week about Moses as well. Moses had just finished talking to God. 
When you get home, read it in Exodus chapter 4. From verse 20, read it all the way down. Exodus 4.20. But don't put it up. Just, uh, there's no time for that. I'll tell you the story. Trust me, I'm telling you the Bible. You believe me? Even if you don't. Anyway, now, Moses had just finished having a conversation with God. God had told him, you are going back to Egypt. They are going to do all these signs. They're, going, they're not going to listen to you, and I'm going to kill all their firstborns. I'll kill all their sons. Moses finished speaking to God and came back to his house. And then we're told God was about to kill him. There, there's a theological debate about who that him is. I'm not going to get into that. But for the purposes of my own narrative today, God was about to kill the child, not Moses. Because the child was the one that didn't have the mark, not Moses. Now, when God came, and why am I, I'm, I'm, follow me. He was about to kill somebody. Let's just leave it like that. He hmm? was about to kill somebody. And then, question, who told Zipporah why God wanted to kill whoever God wanted to kill? Who told her? Which means she knew all along that as a Christian, there is a mark, or rather, as a Jew, there is a mark, as an Israelite, there is a mark that signals touch not. If you don't have that signal, you are entitled to death. So when God came and was about to slay that guy, the Bible says Zipporah took a sharp stone and circumcised the child. And the moment the circumcision came, the signal went up. Stop! And the hand of God was frozen. The covenant, the signal, freezes God's hand or moves God's hand. God was showing Moses what was going to happen to Israel, he just, to Egypt. He just told him about Egypt. That the reason I'm going to kill them is because they don't have the signal. And if your son doesn't have it and he goes with you, it's better he dies here. Somebody say, I am sealed. Is that time correct? <laughs> we are in trouble. <laughs> okay. The seal. The moment the blood came up from that son, and God said, oh, now he's circumcised, you can't touch him anymore. The same angel, whoever it was, that had drawn a sword to cut off his head, or whether it's Moses' head or whoever's head, the covenant stopped. And we have seen signs of this even from men in the Old Testament. Remember the case of Rahab in Joshua 2 from verse 17 and all of that. She had kept the spies. And then the spies told her in verse 17, okay, that's fine. You've helped us. Make sure there is a scarlet rope outside of the window. that you, Not another window. The same window you let us out from. Put the scarlet and when we come, anyone that is inside your house, they warn them, don't let them go out. If they go out, they will be killed. But as long as they are inside your house, when we visit death on everybody, that signal will make us pass it over. That's similar to what happened in Exodus, remember? Mm -hmm. When you get to read it again, Exodus 12. I'm giving you scriptural references because I'm going somewhere. Exodus 12, from verse 12 to 13, God had spoken to them. He said, ah, do this, do that. Mark your doorposts and the lintel with the blood. And when the angel of death is passing by, any door, so even if they had leaked the secret to an Egyptian, it won't matter. What God was interested in is not in the person behind the door, but is in the signal outside the door. So he said, when I see the blood, I will pass you over. Israel went to sleep. While they were sleeping, every other house that did not have the blood was losing their firstborn. It was like a pe You are the one that knew was an angel of death. In modern day, they will call it mad cow disease. They will call it an, any disease that cannot be explained that is killing people. 
that is wiping people out. That's what they were calling medically. Because if you were there as a medical doctor, you didn't, they didn't even see what was killing them. They were just falling down dead. But it was a spirit that was killing them. And while Israel was sleeping, people were dying. They had no idea. They just woke up and found all firstborn dead except their own. How many things do you think have knocked on your door when you are sleeping? <laughs> you think it's because you are smart at work. <laughs> How many times have you gone to bed? Do you think it is in vain that the scripture says, he that keepeth you does not slumber and sleep? All it takes is for God to sleep. Close his eyes. For a second, and I'm telling you, you, your family, and anyone connected to you will be wiped out. Why? Because the devil seeks whom to devour. The only reason he cannot devour you is because you are sealed. Yeah. Not that he's not trying. Every day there is machination against you, against your destiny, against your future, against your children. He's trying to make, if I can't get you, I'll get your child. The devil is a liar. You can't get me, you can't get my child to the third and fourth generation. Why? We are sealed in God. He's constantly at work. But the thing that is keeping him at bay, you need to understand it, is that you are sealed. That signal tells him stop. It is the same thing that says touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Anywhere you go, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, when Israel went from one nation to the other, the people of God from a kingdom to another, he suffered no man to do them wrong, saying touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. All that was happening was that a pronouncement had gone over Israel. And that pronouncement became a signal. It became a seal. So wherever they went, even if you like them or you don't like them, you can't do anything against them. <clears throat> so they hired the prophet, Balaam, come and curse Israel. And he said, there is no divination against Israel. There is no enchantment against Jacob. He said, who is like Israel? A man, a people that has the shout of a king in the midst of them. The shout of the king is the same thing. It's the mark. It's the siren. It's the alarm of a king. Excuse me. How could they hear it? You can't hear it. Don't mean it's not there. You can't see it. Doesn't mean it's not there. Somebody say, I'm sealed. I'm ah, sealed. Yes, you're sealed. You carry the mark. Everywhere you go into, you may not know it. There is a mark on your head that says, this belongs to me. Don't touch it. That one, you can touch. This one, you can't. There is a mark. And it has always been the case from the Old Testament. He will distinguish between him that serves the Lord and him that doesn't serve it. Now in the New Testament, it is no different. You are not an ordinary person. You may look ordinary. There is nothing ordinary about you. Uh-huh. They don't want us to say it. They want us to become philosophical in our preaching. It's a lie of the devil. The preaching of the cross is the power of God. It's not mental. It's not academic. It's power. We have the power of God. We are sealed. I'm sealed. I make no apology to say it. I'm sealed. What happens to them cannot happen to me. Not because of me, but because of what he's done. I'm saved, I'm settled. It is settled in Christ. You cannot undo what was done 3,000 years ago because you cannot undie Jesus. If there's anyone like that, you can undie him. He has died, and once he died, it is settled. A testament is not a force while men are alive. But the moment the man dies, you cannot amend the testament. You cannot alter it. You cannot change it. You cannot add to it. You cannot remove from it. Jesus died, and it is finished. You can't change it. It's too late. I didn't ask for it. I was born into it. I don't work for it. I earn it by right. Inheritance is not earned. Inheritance is given. Ah. Why are you standing up? Somebody punishing you? Sit down. <laughs> ah. I'm just warming up. I'm enjoying myself. I mean, that's the problem. Maybe I'm enjoying myself a little bit too much. Sealed. Somebody say I'm sealed. I'm sealed. So I know who I am. I 
The seal secures the good. It secures it. The seal also signifies the owner or the manufacturer. So when you go around and you walk in the consciousness that you are sealed by God, you are owned by God, anywhere you go, that seal speaks for you. There's a car. When you click on the button and the engine starts, at the top of the bonnet in front, I'm describing it, a woman comes up <laughs> and spreads her wings. They call it the spirit of ecstasy. What that woman is saying is that this car is a Rolls Royce. It doesn't break down M25. <laughs> what that is telling you is that this is manufactured by this person. And he's telling you that we don't have a problem with Toyota. We don't have a problem with Hyundai. We don't have a problem with Kia. We don't have a problem with Mercedes. We don't have a problem with Audi. But this is a Rolls Royce. Huh? When you start your engine in the morning and you rise up, the signal tells everybody, this is a child of God. I don't break down. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? I don't break down. I don't just fall sick. I cannot be killed by a stray bullet. I cannot be killed by a plane crash. I have the seal of God. I am not ordinary. I know who I am. I'm sealed. And if the believer will pay attention and understand the fact that they have this, even though they cannot see it on their forehead, every other force in the universe sees it. For he has been given a name above all names. That at the mention of that name, every knee of things in heaven on earth and underneath the earth, you are in that name. When you come out, they know who you are. They say, Paul, we know. They must make sure your name and recognize you. Why? You are sealed. You are marked different. The chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people for Peter 2 9, that you may display the wondrous excellencies and virtues of God who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are not ordinary. Stop living like one. I have to park this car. Ah, somebody say, I hear. I hear. Say it like you mean it. So you must understand that the seal marks out the owner of that thing that is sealed. Also, the last thing about the seal is that the seal is a mark of finality. You cannot go back and alter it. You know, in the Old Testament, hmm, In Esther, let me get on read it, Esther chapter 8, from verse 7 to 8, we're told that the king sealed the letter. And the Bible says, they said it, they knew it. They said, and whatever is sealed by the king cannot be changed. I'll read it, is there? Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman. And they have hanged him in the gallows because he tried to lay hand on the Jews. Verse 8. Verse 8, please. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. It's a mark of finality. Turn to Daniel. I'm going to give you one more. Daniel 6 verse 17. The same thing happened there. They brought all the princes of Daniel. All of the princes of the king. And they all put it there. Then a stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the den. This is after the king had cast Daniel into the lion's den. 
And the king sealed it with his own signet. And with the signet of his lords. That the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Once it is sealed, it is final. It is not subject to debate. Your life is not subject to debate. What has been sealed cannot be unsealed. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't shout this loud, loud enough. I can't say it long enough. But you are sealed. You must understand what your content is. What are you? What, when we say sealed, final. What is final? What has been achieved? What is the component that Jesus did and placed in you that he now sealed? Because before he sealed it, he first did something. Before they sealed this, they threw Daniel inside the den and sealed it. Before they sealed in the case of Esther, the king wrote something. Wrote something and then sealed it. Before you sealed, there must have been something that was put in and then sealed. What was put in you in Christ? that was sealed, that the communication of your faith may become effective by you knowing the good things that are in you in Christ. Start discovering what you have that has been sealed. Your healing is sealed. Your protection is sealed. It's guaranteed. Your family, your children, because they came from your loins, they cannot function anyhow. Don't sleep. Don't lose sleep over your child. He's acting funny. He's behaving funny. You're afraid. No, 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 no. It came from your loins. You are sealed. He can act the way he can act like Denzel Washington. That's movie. In reality, you tell the guide his life and her life by the words of your mouth. Jacob said, come, and I will tell you what will befall you in your life. Some people say, you don't say that to your children, that you know, you have to give them their freedom. You have to let them do what they want to do. I say, yes, I will let them do what they want to do, but what they want to do is what I've spoken. I don't have to tell them. I will stand here in my place, and I will tell them this is what will happen. And I'm not going to argue with them. And leave them to do what they want to do. And somehow they realize that their steps are colliding with prophecies that have gone ahead of them. Why? Because the word of a king does not fall to the ground. It doesn't matter whether you go to the right and sway to the left. You are coming back to the center. You may travel far. You may travel near. You are coming back to the center. You may act mad. You may act crazy. You are coming back to the center. Your friends may come around you and smoke weed and inject themselves with heroin. It's not your portion. A thousand will fall at your 10,000 at your right hand side it will not come near you why it's not because you are handsome it's not because you are pretty it's not because you know how to dress it is because the God on your inside will make it so stop being afraid for your children we raise them in London so they are passing laws so they want to teach them sex education at five uh huh makes no difference we stand we engage those wicked people and change the laws. In fact, that's another message for another day. But I won't say anything now. Because my, rise up on your feet. It's a matter of time. Somebody say, I am sealed. I'm sealed. Say it like you mean it. I'm sealed. I'm sealed. I'm sealed. 